Um, Danny, I understand that on average your um, patients are likely to have about six sessions. Mm, anywhere between three and six, I'd say. Okay, that's your kind of standard offer? Um, every case is different and yeah. every condition is different. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me just naturally to be somewhere between three and six okay. with an adult. Okay, and if it goes beyond six... Um, it, it implies, presumably, that the, the, the condition requires more extensive treatment. Yeah. But may it also imply, in certain circumstances, that the patient doesn't need more treatment, but, but uh, welcomes the opportunity to be together with you. I would certainly agree with that, that there are some patients where, from a... From an objective point of view, from an orthopedic, physical or physiological point of view, uh, they don't seem to be showing any serious signs, yet treatment continues at their bequest. Right. And what sort of length? How long would it go on for? It can be years. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of brings me to the topic of dependency. Um, which, in, by the sound of it, it, it feels like you're referring to an unhealthy dependency. Where by the sound of it, and others not necessarily, okay. Y yeah. Yes, but because you say there's no real osteopathic need, mm -hmm. but the patient comes back, it might be for... Let me change that to no orthopedic need. But um, from uh, an osteopathic point of view... Right. It all depends what the need is. In other words, there's nothing necessarily orthopedically mm, mm. so wrong. Uh, okay. So are, are you ever, um, do you ever notice that perhaps the motivation on the part of the patient is one of um, uh, dependency and the fear of losing uh, the, the dependent object, namely yourself? Mm. Um, I would say, yeah, there is there there is an element of that, where where they, where some of it seems to be wanting to maintain the relationship with the osteopath, um, the reassurance, the regular reassurance by mm. the osteopath mm. of them not having anything untoward, um, mm. and just a good sort of positive feeling and relationship and atmosphere mm. during the sessions, which they enjoy. Right. Okay, which is in itself not a bad thing, but would could that lead to perhaps boundary violations in time? Um, it might do, but I think in those particular situations, it's up to the osteopath to be clear about the boundaries, um, mm. explaining to the patient what their prognosis is, what mm. would happen if they didn't come for treatment, to be honest about the frequency with which they need the treatment, mm -hmm. um, and not to lead them on. Right, right. So it's, it's, it may happen that in some circumstances the patient may say, look, I need a regular MOT, mm. and if I come once a fortnight, that that's would suit me. That would suit me, and also up to the osteopath, I think, at a certain point in the treatment to say, should we try and move to two week, two, uh, to once every two weeks? Mm. In other words, should we, should we now stop the once a week sessions? Mm. Do, you want, do you want to try? And you might be met by the response of, yes, that would be fantastic. Mm. Or they might be to say, well, you're the expert, you decide. Mm -hmm. um, or, they might, or you might be met with the answer, um, well, uh, what will happen if I don't come once mm, a week? At mm. which point, if you genuinely believe that nothing serious would happen, move to once every two weeks or once every three weeks and continue to try and increase the gaps. Mm, mm. To, uh, so all this adds up to, um, I guess, um, uh, the management of dependency. Yeah. Um, and you'd be alert to that. There is another issue of dependency as well, which can sometimes be... be um, difficult for the osteopath to mm, bear mm. which is a feeling at the beginning of each session when asked the question how have you been this week mm. the patient to go well not much change mm. and sometimes the feeling is put onto the practitioner of 
it's all your fault. Mm. And so mm. one of the ways that one can consider reducing the dependency on the osteopath or the practitioner is to try and move things onto the patient. So exercises that they can do themselves, mm. which shows them that you don't hold a magic wand and that some of the work needs to be done by them. So let's move on to a more, shall we say, extreme situation where you have what you might call a disagreeable patient who wants to come regularly and regularly um, says things like, you're not help, uh, I'm not feeling better, implying it's your fault. Mm -hmm. But they continue coming. And you're having a feeling of disagreeability, you might call it. Mm. How do you manage that? I think in those situations, by, say, for example, the third visit, after visit three, where there's been no change, is to ask the patient, what would you like to do? Mm -hmm. Uh, at which point they might say, well, um, I mean, I've come this far. How come you haven't helped me up until now? You may need to do some explaining and some reassurance about the condition. And also the explanation from the, from the outset that certain conditions are trial to see how the patient reacts, to see how the patient responds. A line that I often use either on the phone or at the end of the first session is, in your particular condition, I'm not sure how you respond. Everybody responds differently. Let's reassess after three sessions to see how you are responding to treatment. Um, and if, as you say in your question, there has not been a positive number of uh, re uh, positive recovery, a number of things can be raised. Why do you think that is? Mm. Mm. I'm, I'm, I really want to keep in focus here the disagreeable patient, the mm. patient who annoys you, the patient who implies that you're not doing your job properly, the patient who uh, comes late and says you're late. Mm. Um, think, how do you cope with the awkward patient mm. in the practice? I, I personally, in that situation... Uh, it does it does knock you a little bit in those situations and i try and keep myself on track there by really checking by really checking that i'm fulfilling my role as an osteopath and by that i mean am i sticking to time am i behaving and talking to the patient as an osteopath should talk am i collecting fees in a professional way? Am I doing the necessary orthopedic tests? If, if, I, if I can say yes to all those questions, then that strengthens my position in my mind that I'm doing the right thing and that there's something going else, something else is going on here to make the patient disagreeable. Mm. And I think it takes away some of the, bl the blame from me. Mm. If I'm able to... Mm to check that I am fulfilling my role as an osteopath mm. and it leads to a better discussion with the patient when you have maintained strong boundaries. Mm. Okay, so it, during the workshops that we ran together, we had a topic called the heart sink patient. Mm. Do you remember it, when somebody asked what's a heart sink patient? He said, well, when you look at your list for the day and you see a name on that list and your heart sinks, mm. Okay, so this is now um, um, not so much, well, it could be connected, of course, challenges to your professionalism, but th there's something about their behavior um, which is more than just disagreeable. Yeah. It gets under your skin, mm. it makes you annoyed, you really want them to go. Mm. Right. It, yeah. it it makes you feel a failure mm. and it undermines uh it, it starts to cause your your the good feelings that you have about yourself it starts to cause them to unravel mm. Mm. yes 
And then how do you handle... And weakens your identity as well. Mm. Mm. Okay, so my question is, would you then attempt to address the patient's personality? Because this seems more like a, a personality issue mm. rather than an osteopathic issue. Right. I would say yes... I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I would sort of address their personality more than I would address their behavior or reflect on their behavior, uh, but it is very tricky. And it can often lead to a powder keg of um, problems. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. It can blow up in your face yeah. and often um, and, and not necessarily lead in the, in, in the way that you want it to. It mm. takes a lot mm. of skill and... right. So in effect, I suppose. But I, sorry, just one. But I would say, very often in those situations where the patient is critical, I think the number one thing to remember is not to get defensive. By right. the way, not to get defensive. Can you say more? About to that? remember that your role at the end of the day is to help the patient. Right. By getting defensive. You're protecting yourself. It often makes the matter worse. Mm -hmm. It's to kind of absorb their critique, to take a step back, mm. and to reinforce to the patient that you are there to help them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that your reflection on their behavior is actually part of the therapy, to help them understand mm -hmm. that part of the problem that they are suffering with mm -hmm. may actually be related to the way that they are behaving to you right now. Mm.